Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Lexi Huffpower, and I'm the marketing manager here at Botero. And your host for today's webinar will be Henry Frith. He is our VP of Customer Success and Sales Engineering. Um, before we get kicked off, I just want to review a couple of housekeeping items. Um, today's session is being recorded. So if you have to drop off at any point or if you lose connection, we will follow up with the webinar recording after today's event. You'll also notice at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A option. So feel free to ask any questions during the presentation and we will uh, we'll answer those at the end of today's webinar. And we'll also have a couple of polls that pop up during the presentation as well. So please feel free to participate in those. And yeah, I will pass it over to Henry and we can go ahead and get started. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's nice to be here today. Thanks for taking some time uh, to spend with us to talk about uh, Votera and what we've seen in the, uh, in the end of last year with threats. Uh, we analyzed nearly 400 million threats with one of our larger customers. And we want to we want to talk about things that we found uh, in, in those um, uh, in those 400, 400 million files. So first, I'll get it to click. First, just tell you a little bit about myself. I've uh, been in cybersecurity for a long time. I started um, I started back in the uh, in the military was how I got interested. Uh, the the device on the right hand side is the first piece of uh, security equipment I ever used. And if you can see it or not, there's a little stamp on it that shows this photo came from a museum of cryptography. So you, you feel old when the equipment you worked was worked with is now in a museum. <laughs> I'm a CISSP and I've worked for many of the uh, largest uh, security vendors out there over my career. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, what we saw in the second half in our financial threat uh, report. So again, uh, we had cus uh, financial customers that shared this data with us, allowed us to uh, uh, generate this uh, report. Uh, so this is real world data that we saw in the second half of last year. Uh, we're going to do a quick poll, uh, talk about uh, password protected files. Uh, then we'll talk about trends in malware delivery and why are, why are the threat actors leveraging files um, to deliver their malicious payloads. Uh, then we're going to talk about one specific threat that we saw multiple times last year. It's a bizarre loader to Cobalt Strike, so we'll go into a deep dive on that. Uh, we'll take one more quick poll about uh, CDR content disarm and reconstruct, and then we'll have some closing thoughts and, and question and answers. Uh, so we collected uh, data and we've uh, generated a report. Again, nearly 400 million files were sanitized. And uh, in those 400 million, we saw multiple threats. And e example of the type of threats that we saw were uh, 260,000 different threats captured uh, from this from these customers. So that's that's quite a bit of threats that we were able to catch that had already been missed by uh, the these customers and a virus engine. So these threats got past AV, they got past secure email gateways. Uh, so they had been through multiple levels of security products already, but still these files ended up in the user's email boxes and we were able to sanitize those files before the user um, uh, before the user the threat hit the user oh, i'm sorry jumped ahead and the type of um, uh, threats that we saw in these um, in these files were uh, documents that used external files so that was by far the most common threat we saw uh, where a macro or script inside of a office pdf or another type of uh, file would attempt to load 
a uh, load a file from an external site. So these are the type of threats that we were able to uh, uh, stop. Uh, we saw uh, uh, just with Mac uh, suspicious uh, macros that ran that tried to uh, even leverage um, software on the user's computer to launch a threat. Uh, we saw dynamic code executions, um, external images. Uh, we also see quite a few of those. So those are things like uh, trackers that can track uh, whether a user is opening a file or not. So we're able to uh, sanitize those. So those trackers are, um, are, are do not work since we're able to sanitize those. And documents that call external OLEs links was uh, was another quite common uh, threat that we saw and protected against. Right, I want to do a poll here, and let's see if I can get this to um, if I can get the poll to show up. And excuse me one moment. And Lexi, I'm not seeing the poll show up. Are you seeing it on your side? Yes, here, I can launch it for you right now. Yep. So here's the poll. How does your organization handle password protected files? Uh, do you block all, all password protected files? Uh, do you block password protected files? And the, and the user needs to open a support ticket uh, to retrieve that file? Do you allow password protected files to certain users or do you allow password protected files to all of your endpoints and uh, to all of your users and then hope that your endpoint security uh, blocks those? So we'll give just a minute uh, to get some answers on that. And Lexi, you wanna go ahead? And let's see, so block, uh, no one blocks all password files. Uh, let's see, block password protected file and opens a trouble ticket. So those are, those are the common uh, answers I get with, uh, with most of my uh, customers and prospects that, uh, that I talk with. So why, why did I bring this up? Why was it important to, um, uh, to ask that question? And, and the, the reason is, is this is a threat vector that we see quite often. And I wanna show you just how easy it is for a threat actor to leverage a password protected file. So I created a Metasploit reverse shell. So if you're not familiar, Metasploit is an open source tool that you can generate um, uh, malicious code with for testing. Uh, red, red teams use it for penetration testing. I use it for demos and labs. So I generate a reverse shell and then I uploaded this reverse shell uh, code to a document that leveraged reverse shell. I uploaded this document. It was called, it was called return to office. It was a word document. I uploaded it and 39 out of 50, out of 64 antivirus vendors. So a little over half of the antivirus vendors knew that this was a malicious uh, piece of software. Well, the, the first thing that really surprised me was the fact that all of the AV vendors, I, I would have soon found it because, you know, uh, this Metasploit reverse shell has been around for, for many years. And it surprised me that um, that 100 percent of the AV vendors did not catch it. So it would have gotten blocked by, by you know, more than half, but still it would have gotten past some others. But if I take that same document, that same weaponized reverse shell, and I password protect it and I upload it to um, to virus totals, none of the AV vendors are able to determine 
that it's malicious. And the, and the reason is they don't have the password. The AV engines do not have the password to unlock this file to check to see if it's malicious or not. So they have to assume that the file is, uh, it, it, that it's not uh, weaponized, that it's a good file. So what, here's an example of a um, phishing email that we saw multiple of our customers receive this same, uh, this same email message. So again, this is quite common now, the, um, the malicious um, actors the, have started to do things like send something that's high, you know, it's highly important. It's got a sense of urgency. And it also, you know, says that um, uh, gives the password uh, to unlock that zip file. So uh, an email, it contains a zip file uh, that is password protected to this, uh, to this password. So the user has a password to unzip the file. And um, excuse me, it, but the AV engines and, and sandboxes do not have the ability to open that file up to analyze it. So it's delivered to the end user. When the end user enters the password for this zip file, it opens up a Word document. And this Word document then has macros enabled. Well, even though we, we constantly are trained via uh, uh, phishing awareness uh, training and, and all not to enable content, not to enable macros, uh, end users still enable those because you know there was a sense of urgency. They, they've been tricked into believing this file came from someone uh, that, uh, that they trust. Uh, so there's, there's many reasons why users would click on these even though we've trained them not to. When they do click on this password protected uh, file, it, it extracts that Word document. They enable macros and then a HTA file, which is an HTML script file is launched. It drops it in the same directory where the um, where that macro, uh, excuse me, where the Word document was, it drops it in the same file uh, directory and it executes a script automatically to download a uh, DLL for a, for a uh, installer. Downloads the installer and then, then installs Bizarre Loader. So Bizarre Loader is a tool that can be used for uh, many, um, uh, it's used by um, the malicious actors for, for many different things, but one of the first things that this one is used for in this case is to reach out and download Cobalt Strike. And we'll talk about Cobalt Strike here in a moment. Uh, once Cobalt strikes down, there's actually two different communication channels back to command and controls that, that this user, that this um, uh, malicious actor now has over this computer. They have the command and control center from the Cobalt strike as well as the bizarre C to C controls. So they completely own this, this machine at this time. And even if, um, even if, the user or the SOC or security team finds uh, one of these command and control centers, it's possible they could, uh, they could miss the other. So uh, Cobalt Strike is in, in this, I, I copied this from the MITRE attack um, framework uh, showing uh, Cobalt Strike. Uh, Cobalt Strike is a commercial uh, a tool used for red teams for penetration testing. And um, it's been around uh, for quite a while. It is a, it's a very, uh, it's a well-supported uh, product. And it was not meant to be used by malicious actors, but what happened was the malicious actors get a copy of the software. They they hack the Cobalt Strike so that it um, they hack the license so that they can run it with a bootleg copy of the license, 
And matter of fact, you can buy Cobalt Strike, the hacked version on the uh, black market on, on the internet. So it's, it's easy to get a copy of this. And it's a very powerful tool. It has the ability to stay underneath the radar to run um, malicious codes, can you communicate back command control centers via a, a single exit point. So how would that be used? It would it'd be used, for instance, uh, from the machine that's originally uh, controlled, that machine from there, the a malicious, um, excuse me, the threat actor could uh, reach out to uh, inside the network and take over a domain controller, for instance. And the SOC team would be analyzing and looking for anything that might be communicating back from a domain controller out to the internet. But the way Cobalt Strike works is it would actually communicate back to another computer inside the network. And then that computer can be the relay out to uh, the command and control center. So by leveraging Cobalt Strike, an extremely powerful, uh, well-supported tool, uh, a malicious actor that may not be e extremely skilled uh, can leverage this tool to to do a lot more damage. And of course, one of the um, use cases may be to deliver uh, ransomware. We're going to do uh, another quick uh, survey. So Alexi, can you start this one up? Perfect. Uh, how familiar are you with content disarm and reconstruction? Uh, I'm, a, I'm CDR obsessed. I've heard of content disarm and reconstruction, but like to know more, or I'm not familiar, familiar with content disarm and reconstruct. And we'll give you a couple moments. Lexi survey says. Okay, uh, looks like we, uh, we, we get to educate the world on content disarm and reconstruct. Uh, this is again quite common um, with content disarm and reconstruction. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, also referred to at Votera, we, re we refer to it as zero trust content security. Uh, Gardner is the one, if you're familiar with the analyst Gardner, they, they're the ones that um, coined the phrase content disarm and reconstruction. And we'll talk about the, uh, the history of it here in a, mo in a moment. Uh, but in, in the examples that we've talked about up to this point, we've talked about content, uh, excuse me, we've talked about threats that Votero saw in email. Uh, Votero also uh, has the ability to connect really anywhere that files can come into your organization. So if you if you look over on the right side here, Votero uh, comes as, uh, as a cloud, as a SaaS offering. Uh, we also have um, uh, virtual appliances and private cloud offerings as well. Uh, but then we connect into anywhere that data can be coming into your network. Uh, we connect in with br remote browser isolation tools, other cloud security tools, pardon me, and then integration with SaaS-based applications such as Box, Dropbox, uh, Slack, you know, other collaboration tools as well as business applications, Office 365, ServiceNow, Salesforce. So we can, anywhere that files are coming into your organization, uh, Votera can um, uh, sanitize those files and it's all based on open, open APIs and then, uh, and then plugins. So uh, content disarm and reconstruction started about 10 years ago, the concept. And what, uh, what uh, the first level of CDR did was we flattened every file that came into the organization that could be weaponized. So if an Excel or a Word document, for example, came in, 
to your organization uh, via email, which was the primary use case for CDR in the past. Those files would be converted from an office format, for instance, to just a PDF. So it, it uh, any malicious code, uh, macros, anything that was in that file, of course, were gone because it was no longer an office document, it was a PDF. So this made for very secure files, but they weren't very usable. If you were expecting an Excel spreadsheet and you received a PDF copy of that Excel spreadsheet, it's, it's not very useful. You could read it, but couldn't make any, uh, many, any changes to it. So about five years ago, the technology uh, matured and what we started to do was just strip uh, anything that could be malicious out of a file. So we kept its original file format, whether it was a Word document, Excel document, uh, even a, a PDF with uh, active content in it. We would, we would take that, um, uh, take uh, those files and we would strip out any of the, um, uh, anything that could be malicious inside of it. Uh, but we also took out any mac all macros all, uh, and all scripts. So legitimate macros, legitimate scripts were also uh, removed. So now we're at what we refer to as level three CDR. And now we, we use a completely new process. And instead of removing all of the um, active content that is inside of a file, we only, uh, we only remove uh, uh, content that is not known good. So we'll uh, talk about that. So how does, how does it work? How do we, how do, we do this today? Um, what we do is when a file comes in to Votero um, uh, into your organization and, and it's forwarded to Votero via API, and again, it doesn't matter if it's an email or any other way that files are coming into your organization, uh, the first thing we do is we analyze that file and to, to determine what its type is. Is it really a, if it says it's an Excel file, is it really an Excel file? And if it is an Excel file, we spin up a new blank template and an Excel template. So we have the original Excel file. And again, it works with uh, up to 150, around 150 different file format types. Uh, but again, we'll, we'll use Excel as an example. Uh, we'll, we'll spin up a new blank Excel format, uh, formatted file. And we move all of the known good portions of the original file to the new file, and this, and we do this in you know less than a half a second, or or even faster on uh, on smaller files. So it's extremely fast. It's near real time. The users really don't even realize this is going on. It happens so fast. So when, instead of all, like all other security products out there today um, are looking for known bad, we look for known good. So we just move the good portions over to this new file. We re reconstruct it. So you have a, a new sanitized file. And then we do some automated fidelity testing on it we, just to make sure that we didn't corrupt the file during that process. And then we deliver the fully functional uh, sanitized file to the end user. So again, this is extremely fast, uh, near real time. And um, uh, we end up with a sanitized file that is safe for the user to use afterwards. And just a uh, high level, this is kind of what it, what it you know, how, how it works at a high level. Uh, we start with, you know, resume. So um, if someone's in HR and all day long they're receiving resumes and they may come in Word form format or PDF or, you know, some open office type format. And as they come into the organization, what we do is we analyze them. We make sure that it's really whatever format it is uh, that it says it is. So example, if 
this one's a PDF. We make sure it's a PDF. And as soon as we know it's a PDF, we create a new blank sanitized file uh, and we move all of the known good over. So that includes known good scripts. So if they were a script in uh, this file that was calling in, you know, an uh, 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 calling in data to populate this um, this resume, uh, then that script would would work because it's, um, you know, it's known good. It's a, a it's a script that we've seen and 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 know is good. It's not trying to it's not trying to reach out and pull in a another script from um, from some unknown side. So email a you know, again, users, uh, excuse me, threat actors will continue to leverage uh, things like password protected files and, and weaponized documents to, uh, to, to deliver their payload. So again, think of zero trust. You want to not trust any file coming into your organization. You want to sanitize every file that comes into your organization. So that's... Um, kind of where we were going to end and uh, now be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, here. Um, it looks like we actually had a few questions come in to the q and I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a moment. Um, we also had one come into our, our chat earlier, Henry. Um, I think when you were reviewing the threats we found in our uh, financial threat report, okay. um, someone asked, we were talking about uh, threats that actors leverage to track activity. Um, and then someone asked, why would a threat actor want to track our activity? Why would they leverage threats simply to track us? Yeah, and it's um, it's not necessarily threat actors. It can just be, you know, it, there are legitimate um, reasons to track uh, who's opening a file that are not malicious. We're, we're, we're a software company and we, we sell software and we want to know if you open up uh, an email that we send to you. So there are, you know, tools that will allow um, our sales team to send you an email and know when that uh, file was open. You may not, you know, you may not want to do that. You may not want to. Uh, People that are trying to sell you stuff know when you open the uh, open the email, so uh, it's it's an option in you know in our products just to uh, to remove trackers. So um, uh, malicious what what reasons? Um, I can't think of any you know truly malicious. It's more privacy laid related. Perfect. That makes total sense um, and, and Gianna brings up a, um, a good point she said you know you know if someone's is doing a very targeted attack they may just want to know did you uh, did you open that file uh, you know maybe maybe the malware is delayed and nothing launches right away other than them knowing that uh, that the file has been open so that's that would be a good use case for uh, for it also. Mm -hmm. All right. And one of the other questions we had uh, pop up in our Q&A, um, I know we talked a lot about some sandboxing and AVs today and, and traditional security methods. So someone asked, what is a way that CDR can be combined or how does it work with other detection-based security methods to sort of bolster someone's overall security approach? Uh, yeah, great question. Um, yeah. I like to think of uh, CDR as kind of that last mile. So it's been through all of the other security controls up to that point. So uh, every, the report that we showed you, all of those uh, threats that we found, uh, what was it, two, uh, almost a quarter million uh, threats, or well, I think it was a little more, 260,000, were... Um, those threats had already been through AV and through uh, sandboxing and, and still were to, you know, would have been delivered to the end user if we hadn't have sanitized it at, at you know, as the last step. So 
CDR is an additional security layer. It's all about, you know, adding as many layers of security as you can to, to make sure. We're, we're not saying that CDR is replacing tech, you know, any of your security stack. Uh, yet we do see customers and we have some of our customers replace part of their security stack after using us. Uh, but in general, it's, it is a, just another layer of security on top of what you're doing. And it works with all of your security controls that you have in place. Uh, we're not going to impact any of those controls. Perfect. Thank you so much, Henry. Uh, I think we have uh, just one more question. Um, we have time for one more question in our Q&A. Um, someone also asked, what are some obstacles companies might face when trying to implement a zero trust strategy. So what are some obstacles you think they might face or any obstacles you've come upon um, in your time with Votero? I, I, the, the thing about zero trust is we, any, you know, uh, there's a lot of security vendors out there talking about zero trust and, and there are many different ways to, uh, uh, to, uh, to address uh, the, the, the whole zero trust security posture. I, I think the, the hardest part that when I talk to customers that are early stages and starting to talk about it is, is where do we start? Which part of zero trust do we, do we address first? Because there's the, there's the network layer, there's the users, there's the devices, there's content. Which one of those do you, do you go after first? Well, you know, I'm I'm I like the content idea that you know it it's it's all about your content. So I I would I'd say you know if you can start with content, that's a good place to start. But really, any place that that you feel comfortable, uh, pick one of the uh, one of the areas. Work with your vendor of choice in zero trust uh, for that particular portion of your infrastructure or your data. And, and just get started at it. Um, I think probably that seems like the most, that, that that's one of the biggest things is where do I start? Not, not that, you know, customers understand they need to start uh, thinking about it, but where do I start? Yeah, that's perfect, Henry. And we did, we did have uh, one more question just come through if you wouldn't mind answering one more sure. for us. Um, someone asked, do we integrate with any sandboxes? Yes, uh, we we do. Um, uh, today we're we're um, we work in conjunction with a lot of sandboxes and email. So really, any email sandbox that you're using, they would set in front of us in an email flow before we sanitize the file. So we work perfectly well with any uh, email sandbox that you may be using today: a Mimecast, a Proofpoint, Ironport, uh, any of those we work with. Uh, and, and then we also have um, direct integration with Fortinet into their sandbox so we can, uh, we, we can uh, forward uh, files that we get in other uh, formats uh, uh, other than uh, email. Uh, for instance, if we're, if we're connecting and, and sanitizing files in Dropbox and there's a binary file in there that we want to analyze as part of that, we can forward it to uh, uh, Fortinet if you happen to use Fortinet. And if you use another sandbox that you would like to talk with us about integrating with, uh, since it's all API driven, it's very easy to integrate with additional vendors products also. Perfect. Thank you so Thanks. much. Thank you. All right, y'all. I think that is our time for today. Um, I will make sure to follow up with everyone who attended with a recording of the webinar in case you'd like to watch it back. And of course, you can um, contact us at info at votero.com. And I'll include all of that in a follow-up email as well as our, uh, our threat report that we discussed earlier in the webinar today. Thank you so much, Henry, and thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, have a great day. Thank you.